This is with community participation, so I'm asking questions and stuff, so you gotta pay attention. Or, or do this all the time, uh, either works. How can I type in? What? <laughs> yeah, well, just, just raise a hand for like, I, I say yes for every question, okay. Good night then. Um, I'm talking about Evently. Who has heard about Evently? You don't count. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, who's interested in CouchDB? Awesome. Cool. Who, who's, who's never written a CouchDB application? Be honest. Who has who has no idea how it works? That's cool. So, my name is Jan Leonard. I work on CouchDB. I also wrote Mustache JS, which is Chris Wonstroth's awesome templating library, but in JavaScript, which a lot of people use these days. Who likes Mustache JS? Sweet. Um, all the code I'm talking about is by J. Chris Anderson, which my my co-author, co-founder, good friend, whatever he. But his wife is pregnant, so he's not here. Uh, but I think the code he wrote was pretty cool. So I thought I should talk about this in track B. Can you all hear me good? Should I speak louder? In the back, can you hear me? Cool. Um, so what the hell are CouchDB applications? Um, CouchDB applications are, are HTML, <laughs> JavaScript, <laughs> sorry, HTML, CSS, JavaScript applications that live inside CouchDB. CouchDB is a web server. It has an HTTP, stack, uh, HTTP web server built in. So all you need to talk to CouchDB is an HTTP client. And your browser happens to be one. It's not a good one, but it works, works OK. So you, you, you put some HTML into CouchDB. It gets a URL. And then point your browser at that URL. The browser gets surfed the HTML and renders it. Then you define some script tags and, Java and, and CSS and whatever. And all these stuff gets loaded also. And all that gets rendered into a regular old website that has dynamic content. Um, a nice thing about that is once you have that website loaded, you can use Ajax to talk back to CouchDB's database facilities. So you have a full-blown database-backed application that lives in the database and in the browser. And the key thing that is missing here is the middleware layer that most of you are probably used to. That is Rails, Django, Java, PHP, all of that. There is none of this. This is a two-tier, a two-layer um, architecture. So you, everything you hate about Rails, you don't even have to worry about that. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is good, a lot of reasons why this is not what doesn't do everything you would want to do, but this is pretty cool because all you do is write some HTML and that, that's your app. Um, on top of that, they are shareable. Why, why that is important and how that works, I'll get to pretty soon. Um, one slide, sorry Tom, on CouchDB um, <laughs> and how it works. Um, CouchDB lets you store documents. We call them documents, but they are just blobs of JSON that you can fill with whatever you like, and every document can look different if you want to. It just schema the storage. You can give each document a name and retrieve that by a document back by that name. It's a simple key value store, but there's also querying facilities and a lot of other stuff that makes it really, really useful. And the interesting thing about documents is they can have attachments just like email can have attachments. So you can attach just arbitrary binary data like images, like HTMLs and CSS and JavaScript to a document. Like I said, it gets a URL and can be loaded by any HTTP client like a browser. CouchDB is HTTP all the way. Everything in CouchDB has a URL. You can address everything um, through that like nat native web protocol. Um, shoot me if I say HTTP again. Um, CouchDB has replication built in. Who, know, who has an idea about what replication is? Who has an idea about what CouchDB replication is? I was cool. Uh, forgot most of the things you know about replication. CouchDB replication is different. CouchDB replication is inherently multi-master, peer-to-peer replication. You can have any number of databases, and they can all synchronize with each other at their own leisure. They don't have to be connected all the time. You can take databases offline, work with them offline, take them online again and, and re-sync and re-replicate re all the data you need. Um, anyway, that is totally unlike all the other replication schemes work. Uh, who thinks this is pretty cool? Awesome. Yeah. Who hates this? Sweet. I'm confused. That, I'm often confused. That's cool. Are you often confused? OK. Why are you confused? Um. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, more people coming in. All right, I'm done. No. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to point out that CouchDB has, there's a ton of more in CouchDB, which I don't want to bore you with. By the way, who's seen last year's talk? 
while you guys rock. Um, the changes feed that CouchDB has is you, you can subscribe to changes in a CouchDB database. You open and make an HTTP request, much like an ad, uh, like a comment request to CouchDB Intel, ask it. When anything happens in that database, send, get, send me a notification. Like, let me know. And then this request just hangs there and waits, waits for stuff in the database to happen. And the, like the browser or the, other, the client who does the request to change just sits there and waits for stuff. Whenever you change something in the database, you add a new document, you delete one, you update one, you get a line of JSON that tells you which document got updated. So the client can act on that. So say you display a list of tweets and a new tweet comes in and you see the changes feed tells you that's a new document. You, you figure out if that's a new tweet you want to render and then you just fetch that one tweet and prepend it to the list you want to have. That You don't have to like do a full page reload. It's a little bit Ajaxy, But you get notified when something happens instead of you polling every time. Is there something new? Is there something you know? Is there something you know? You don't do that. You just get a notification when something's happening. Th sort of like a callback but with a, with a line of JSON. Um, this is pretty awesome for building dynamic interactive apps. We'll see that in a bit. Um, we call CouchDB applications Couch Apps. Well, I, I introduced that already. And what is that? The beamer's a little bit off, but whatever. Um, CouchDB applications that I said that fully live in CouchDB um, live in something we call design document. Everything in CouchDB is a document, but there's a special kind of document that we call design document that holds all the data that is um, relevant for that application. It's just a big JSON blob. It includes all the JavaScript code, all the HTML, all the CSS, all the attachments that you want to have uh, on that, that one design document. Um, on top of that, all the, the application logic, like I said, like, uh, all the application logic lives in there. And well, I guess nobody here really cares. But CouchDB actually doesn't care either. Uh, if you use JavaScript to do it, it's the default. But there's an implementation for Ruby, for Erlang, if you're into that, it's hardcore. Uh, Python, uh, people working on a PHP one. So if you like any, other of the any of the other scripting languages, and I hope you don't, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, <laughs> you can use that. So if you like have existing stuff or people you don't want to train on JavaScript, which you, I hope you don't, <laughs> then you wouldn't be here. Anyway, this is actually language agnostic. That's all I want to say. Um, but it is, what? Well, to, to start coding with that, there's th three things you want to know about. The first thing is Couch App, which is conveniently named like the thing I talk about, the CouchDB application. But it's also a utility you can install on your, com on, on your Unix computer, or I think it works on Windows, on any computer. It's a small Python script. Um, I talk, told you about the design documents that hold all the JavaScript and JSON and HTML and CSS inside a big JSON structure. Um, that is the application. How that exactly works or looks, I'll show you in a bit, but just bear with me. You have a big blob of JSON that includes all the code. And then you think about editing that. You are inside a JSON string, and then there's some CSS or, or JavaScript, and you have to double, in, double escape quotes, and it's all horrible, and you don't want to do that. CouchUp lets you take all that big JSON and dump it into the file system into a folder structure that maps some JavaScript code into .js files, CSS code into .css files, so that you can use your native programming environment to get syntax highlighting, to get uh, contextual help, all the things you, you get from your IDE or from text, text meta, max, whatever you use. Um, you code in the native environment of that particular language. And then with the couch app push command, you can catch we text this full folder structure that, again, I'll show in a second, munge it into this big JSON structure that CouchDB knows how to do an app out, out of and put it into CouchDB. So you don't have to worry about double escaping quotes and stuff. Uh, the next two things, CouchDB ships with two JavaScript libraries, couch.js and jQuery.couchjs. Couch, the, the main difference between them is uh, CouchJS is standalone. jQuery is of, the jQuery.couchjs is obviously jQuery dependent. But CouchJS is uh, synchronous, and the jQuery CouchJS is asynchronous. Um, CouchJS is simpler. It's a good. Uh, boilerplate to implement your own li uh, library in a different language. It's a good starting point to learn the CouchDB API. Um, it's very easy to read, and it's what the, test, the CouchDB's test suite uses. For any real application, you want to use the async, non-blocking jQuery version that uses callbacks and everything, that you can have responsive applications while requests are running. So it's a little bit more complicated code-wise, but it's pretty neat. And as of two weeks ago, it has proper documentation, API docs, uh, unit tests, and all that, what you want. Um, all on GitHub, too. Um, but if you use these tools, you still need to learn these, learn how to use CouchDB. Uh, you get 
raw CouchDB responses back um, uh, from CouchDB. You have to munch them into any data. Um, I call that low-level work. You're, you're actually like you're piecing, uh, you, you're working with bits and pieces and put them together that make up your application instead of thinking about how your application should behave or look like. This is, this is low-level grunt work. Um, you have to manage all the paths that you want to use. Uh, the URLs inside CouchDB, I'm in the design document, relative path to an attachment, figure all that out. Um, handle all the events you want, data UI, all that stuff. It, it's a lot of work. It's still pretty easy. I write like five couch apps a week. They're really, really simple to start with. It takes a half hour to write one, and it's already useful. That's the power of a couch app. You don't have to think about writing one. It's, you just do it. Uh, but we can make it simpler. The goal we have with with CouchDB is bringing programming closer to people who are, are not computer scientists, who are not computer enthusiasts, but people who happen to use a computer and want to solve a particular problem. And we don't really care, or they don't care at all, what the tools are. They just want to, I want to make an invi invitation list for my party, for, my, for, for whatever, uh, for a nice conference. I want to organize a pirate cruise. Um, and I need some tool to do that. And I want an easy way to make it. The thinking here is, Basically, what drove Alan Kay in the 70s to do all the work he did at Xerox Park? Who's a fan of Alan Kay? Who is not a fan of Alan Kay? Get out of here. <laughs> right. Um, his, his, his research was like, how much attention can a person that is not trained in computer science um, spend on something that is computer related? And he figured out kids can do one to two pages of code to do something, adults can like, do five or six pages of code. That's it. So he had to invent something that allowed him to write any application in one or two or five or six pages of code. So how do you write Photoshop in five, li uh, five pages of code? That, that was his problem. It was pretty bold. So he invented object-oriented programming and small talk, and he came up with, with a study group of kids, school kids, who wrote their image editors in small talk in a page of code. Pretty awesome. We want to go in that direction. Like, you're all, I don't know how many, any computer science majors, PhDs, whatever. It's great what you're doing. We don't care about you. <laughs> like this stuff is like it's peanuts for you. You can do that really, really easy. We're really targeting people who have no idea how that all works, and they barely understand what a browser is. Um, eventually, is our first step in that direction. It is not yet writing things in the page of code. It is not very simple. You still need to be a computer geek to understand it. But it's our first step at reducing a ton of uh, fraction or friction from not fraction friction uh, from writing apps. They are declarative. So instead of writing a bunch of code that pulls stuff uh, together, we wrote a library, eventually, or, or that Chris wrote it, to do all the heavy lifting and give you uh, a piece of declaring what you want to do. Get some data from here, munch it in some way, limit, just give me just 25 rows of it, that sort order, and inject it into that HTML. That's all you should, should be able to do. Um, or should have to do. It runs client side or server side. I'm focusing on client side here, but Chris is working on the server side, um, the server side only version two, which if, if you want to be good, want to be searchable by Google or for any other reason, need something that works without JavaScript in the client, you can have something that's pretty dynamically scriptable, but renders static HTML to the client, which is pretty nice, I think. And it's the same code to generate both versions. And it's extremely simple. I hope that's a good point. So what do you do? Um, there's a couple of steps involved. The first thing is you need some, this is code heavy. If you don't like code on slides, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> you need a frame uh, of HTML, this, w w what your application is. So what this effect, that's just some boilerplate. We have a, uh, a title and an, a div that, that holds a list. So we want to display a list of some sort. Um, we have another HTML fragment that we want to inject later or want to give to Evently to, to uh, add to that page, which is just a UL tag with a class name. We want to fill that with something that we query CouchDB with. And that's just a JSON structure that tells Evently to query CouchDB with a certain set of parameters. So to query, though, that's a mechanism in CouchDB to query your documents by whatever you want. We call them views. And the first line of view is list. We, there's a, a view called list that we define later that we want to call and that returns results that we want to display. Pretty simple. And there's, there's query options. We want descending equals true, so we want to have backward sorting. We want only 10 of them. And um, we tell Evently that we only want new rows. So Evently is smart enough to figure out if you already have, have a row 
from, from your view result displayed in your application and doesn't fetch it again. So you don't end up with duplicate data in your list. So it's, it's a little bit smart on that end. This is our map function that defines our view. This runs through all your documents and just looks if your doc is a thing and has a title. And if it does, it calls the emit function. The emit function just produces a result from your query, a row of no, a result row uh, for your query. So this will emit for all the documents or will create a result for all the documents that are a thing and have a title and sort things by title. Um, this is one of the, this is like this. This is one of two pieces of JavaScript you gotta write still. This is not declarative. Like I said, we're not there yet. Um, this is the other piece. It takes a result row and munges into something that Mustache understands. I gotta ask again, how many here people, like there's more people here. How many people love Mustache? Of the new ones? Sweet. Um, so all this does is it gets a result row. We already know it's just that, like a, it has a title in there, um, which is the key of the row. And we got to return another object that we can hand into, uh, put into mustache. Then there's a fragment that we also feed into mustache um, that, that does the munging of putting the actual data in. This is a mustache interlude for the people who don't know it. You have some HTML that has a mustache tag in it. Um, you have a JavaScript object here that matches all the tags that you have in your HTML, and it produces some HTML. When there's a little bit of logic you can have in there, um, but all the logic you want to have or you can have is actually in in the JavaScript part, in the JSON object you have that you can define functions and, and iterators and stuff. You can loop over things, and you can say you can have bo uh, boolean sections, but that's it. There's no logic at all in your HTML code. It makes for ex extremely clean um, HTML templates and also avoids inventing a new language for templating because JavaScript is already a programming language. Why should we invent another one to do templating that then gets executed inside JavaScript? The cool thing about Mustache, about my implementation of Mustache, it's just two pages of code. It's very reasonable. It's not the smartest and not the fastest thing. It uses a lot of regex and stuff, but it loads very quickly and is fast enough that Twitter uses it on their homepage, which makes me extremely proud. But then but I digress. So um, after we went eventually ran, it loaded all the stuff you wanted, it queried the, the couch TV, it did the data munging, it creates that HTML. This, uh, this and this is from, from the original thing, and the UL and the two lines are from the fragments I showed you. The UL tag and everything enclosed is what we call an eventually widget. A widget is defined by HTML, an HTML fragment, uh, query parameters if you want to have a query, and so the, all the stuff I showed you just now. Um, you can have any number of widgets on your page. They are all independent. They work independently from each other. Um, I'll show you how that works with Tasker. It's demo time. Um, oh, damn, that's not going to work. So hey, welcome to Tasker. Um, this is a little to-do application we wrote for our work at Catch.io. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, it has, it has a login widget. If I reload, I'm probably log out. Right, I gotta log in. My password is one, two, three, four, five, in case you wanna try out. And I mistyped. That's good, I'm logged in again. Um, I can create new tasks. Let's see. Which is pretty cool. It shows up here. There's a list of all the tasks I have. There's a bunch of tags and usernames. Uh, we, we chose this form, format from Twitter because we use Twitter a lot and using hashtags and usernames to organize stuff is very natural to us. So we just use that. Um, on top of that, there's another thing here, uh, a, ta a, hash, uh, a tag cloud of hashes and a tag cloud of usernames. So J. Chris asked Jan about feedback from JSCon, if I can't really type. And what you see when I add that task, the, the tag cloud gr grew a little bit. And it added the jchris username over there. That's two independent widgets again. So each of these widgets on the page in, independently interact with CouchDB. They're independently defined, and there's no, like, there's no tight coupling between them. If I, if I wanted to disable just one of them, I could just do that, and the rest of the stuff would still work. Um, each of these widgets are defined anyway. Um, the, the list here and the tag clouds are defined to listen to the CouchDB changes feed I talked about, to like, let me know when something new happens. Uh, the input box here creates new documents. So whenever I create a new thing here, this widget 
gets a notification from CouchDB, hey, there's something new. Maybe, maybe you want to check it out. So it does some magic to figure out that this is the new, uh, that this is the new task I want to display, and it prepends that to that list uh, in descending order. Same thing, uh, it, yeah, it, it prepends it to the list. The tag clouds work a little bit differently. They're redrawn entirely every time you update something, but they also listen to a different, like with a separate request to the changes feed, something new happens, parse the message, there's a username and a tag in it, and both of them have to redraw and resize the specific tags. The login widget on the top right is another widget. That is something we provide. So all the, there's a lot of stuff we already d did for you. You never have to code any login system. That's already on the top right there. Um, so this is, this is pretty neat. Let's look at how this looks like. Opie, can we lower or can, I need to see the top bar. Oh, there we go. This is not bad. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> cool. WebGL. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So let's close all of them. So this is the basic structure of a couch app. Uh, like I said, the couch app tool. Well, sorry, I screwed up the video, I guess, but we got to live with that. Um, the CouchApp tool takes this directory structure and turns it into a JSON, like the JSON document that CouchDB needs. Um, but for our convenience, we can access everything in files and folders, which is pretty nice. Um, so there are views. There's a vendor for, for a vendor directory for all the code you don't have to worry about. Um, there are attachments where all the images and CSS and stuff lives. And there's a folder called Evently that we look into pretty briefly. The first thing we look at is index.html. Because that's what things start with. Traditionally, uh, we probably want to reset. Nobody joke about my color theme. It's my <laughs> color theme, and I love it. Um, there are many, but this is mine. That's why we have options. <laughs> um, this is effectively the thing I just showed you. It just has a few more widgets, uh, a few more, uh, a little bit more markup. Uh, this, there's a sidebar that includes the tag cloud and the user cloud. Um, there's the activity widget that includes the profile and the task we're seeing, and that is, that is the UI. Pretty easy. And then there's some CSS that styles it, but the next step is then to use Evently to hook things up to it. Um, the next thing should be scripts. Remind me to use mirror displays next time. Um, this should look familiar. This is just a, the, a, a jQuery callback that we define in the, the catch app um, library we ship with it, with Evently. Um, and all you do is you match all the widgets you define in your, in your HTML and call Evently on them. You provide a path to the defini definition of the widget. We'll look at that in a second. And that's it. That's initializing the tag cloud. And then Evently will know how to do that. Uh, we do that for the, for the user cloud, for the profile, for the account, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we get to the Pathfinder. Pathfinder is effectively semi-JS. And it is not really semi-JS, but it's so good. We, Jacob just ripped it all out and put it into Evently. Um, semi-JS lets you do MVC-style routing based on fragments in the URL, and it's very, very neat. And we just we call it Pathfinder and put it in there. But it's effectively the same thing, so big props. Um, and Pathfinder makes the application start at slash. We see why that is important in a second. So we look at the Evently folder. Uh, There's just a lot of stuff here. These are the widgets that are live on the site. They're all, all separate. If you, would, if you would remove one of them and the line in the app.js file, uh, nobody would complain. It will all still work. And there's no interdependencies between them. So what we want to look at here is tasks. And they're organized by mentions, recent tags, and users. So we look at the recent first. Um, the first thing we look at is the path.txt. This is just by convention. There's a lot of code by convention in here. This matches the, the Pathfinder thing, where to start with your app. Kind of obvious, I guess. Um, there's a mustache fragment here. Oh, we saw that previously, that wrap the stuff I'm about to query into that one. That's going to be my, my widget frame, basically. And then I have a new folder, uh, selectors, that gives, uh, has a new folder called UL that includes another folder, changes. Which this thing looks, looks a bit odd, but what it does is, um, for all the selectors in here, run jQuery 
run, run the jQuery function and pass in the folder name as the CSS selector. So for all the ULs that we define in this must hash, which is, happens to be this, um, listen to the changes feed and do whatever I define in here. Um, the first thing is look at a query. We saw that before. We're querying the recent tasks view. We get 25 of them. We get them descending by true. And again, we only want the new rows. There's a mustache. No, yeah. There's a, uh, a master fragment. It's a little bit bigger than the other one, uh, but it draws each, each widget in here, uh, each item or each task in the task list. Um, this is really just, just plain HTML with the mustache tags in here. It's very, very simple again. Um, there's a data.js function that looks a bit crazy because Chris is really keen on one character variables, and we've got to have a talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have time to fix it. Um, but this is the thing. It takes the, the, the CouchDB result and turns into something that, that uh, the mustache fragment understands. So it's just a simple transform. Um, that should, well, and whenever the changes feed triggers an update, that gets, all that gets run and adds a new line, which is like when I added the new, I clicked on the new tasks in Evently, all that code is run and adds a new thing. Hey there. This is the HTML that, that I just showed you. This is the content coming from the database. There's some magic to show my picture. Um, but that is all the code there is. Now, this could be useful as is, but we see here that there are, when I hover over a thing, uh, over a task, there's, there's things I can do. I can mute it. I can, I can done it. Uh, I can do stuff with it. So the thing that uh, Evently allows you to, to recursively define new, uh, more behavior on the, on the HTML you just created. So we look at the HTML again. We have a link that says done in line 11 over here. Oh, that is a, and uh, goes to the done. We have another folder called selectors, which is the same selectors folder as above, but like further down the stack. And we have another folder in there that is again a jQuery or a CSS, a CSS selector. And wherever that matches on the HTML we just generated, uh, we can have another JavaScript execute. So this is the done, I think. Um, this uh, effectively just sets the document state to done for this particular item, and then does some stores this back to the database. Um, but you can add deep, uh, as deeply nested behavior to that. If that generated new HTML, you can add more behavior to that and go as deep as you want. You can also nest widgets as deep as you want. But this is, this is basically just how it works. Um, OK, that's seven more slides, and then I'm done. Um, so questions later. Um, Built-in documentation. Cool. You can go back to the browser. So whenever you try out Tasker or any other uh, event the app, there's documentation built in. You just click on this link, and it takes you to a bunch of markdown files that get rendered out of CouchDB. And um, this describes how it eventually works. This is the place you want to go uh, after my talk to like reread how all these things work. Uh, it has code that you can try and run. It has simpler, co simpler code than I just showed. And it is uh, executable documentation. So if I added this here and here, I can actually run this example and it will use my changes and the actual behavior here. That's a little bit more complicated stuff, so you can learn about more things. So you click on that, and we like Jane, and we actually don't like Jane, but we actually do like Jane. Um, so that's all the magic you can, uh, you can think of in your UI. Um, and there's more stuff here I'm not going, going to get into. Um, this, is how, this is how it works. So built in docs, awesome. Um, if you, like I'll upload the slides in a bit, you, Follow my Twitter on Jan L. Um, that's where the, the, the that's the links you want to go to. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. I'm Jan at Apache.org. Follow me on Twitter if you have any questions. Add reply me. I'm maybe not too drunk to help. Um, there's CouchDB, all about Couch on CouchDB.org, all about my company on Couch.io. Um, the Tasker project on GitHub is the only way to get to Evently right now because we wrote Tasker and then extracted all the things we wrote to make Evently. And we didn't like invent, invent Evently to make an app, but the other way around, because that's how you should do it. And then we write the, we, Chris and I wrote the O'Reilly book for CouchDB with a guy called Noah from the UK. It's an open source book. You can get to it at books.couchdb.org. You can just read all about CouchDB there. Uh, thank you. So.
Who, who's still confused? <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, any questions? Come on. Yep. Okay, so I just installed it and did your little demo and loaded extensions. There's three loaded extensions. What are extensions and where do I get them? What, what, what? It says CouchDB vendor handler, Git vendor handler, and Curial vendor handler. What else? Oh, that's after? that's the the Couch app uh, yeah. tool. Okay, uh, extensions are are you can make. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Um, you can have Couch App uh, handle code that lives someplace else. So when we when we develop Mustache, it's a standalone project. But if you want to use Mustache inside a Couch App, that's what I wrote it for. Uh, I don't want to copy the data around, so I can create a vendor directory that keeps track of code that lives someplace else, and that can live in either Mercurial or or, or Git. Um, please look at sorry, yeah, like like Git modules, but wrapped around the Couch App thing. So it's um, agnostic to the version control system you're using. Because the guy who wrote Couch App was actually a Mercurial guy that we slowly converted to Git, but when he wrote that, he was still a Mercurial. Um, right. More questions. Who thinks this is cool? I win. Thanks. <laughs> I'll tell. I actually, I should take a picture of that for Chris, <laughs> but I won't. Haha. -ha. Hey, I've got another question. Cool. How, how do I test it? Good question. Um, I have a, like, our company website is built like that. Uh, and I'm using the Ruby testing uh, stack that has all the, uh, what is it called? The web rack and, and uh, the cucumber and stuff, all that, all that stuff, yeah. Um, the, if, if you're not following the Ruby guys on how testing is done, you're doing it wrong. Or well, these guys are leading it. Um, if you, we, we need to catch up with that. I, you, you're doing a lot of good stuff too. You're, you're doing the catching up, but. Um, uh, there's more stuff we need in the JavaScript world. And well, if you're a Python or PHP guy, um, get your communities to adopt what the Ruby guys are doing and try to be innovative in there or innovative there too. What's your timeline roadmap? Ta for what? For this. You said you're working on server side. Uh, the server side, I think, is done. Um, I just haven't had the time to look into how it actually works. So I wouldn't, didn't feel comfortable to work on uh, to, to, to present it. Um, this is priority work. We've been doing that. Like this is, but well, like eventually, so like as as is is done. But there are a lot of to do points to make it even simpler. But you can use it as is now. And there's not much like like the the general structure will stay the same. There's just like more. We will add more convenience that you can remove more code that you have to write now. Um, CouchDB is at version 011, which is our feature freeze release for 1.0, and we hope to ship 1.0 in the next couple of weeks. But that is open source, so it might take a little longer. But we're in the, we don't change couch to be anymore. We only fix bugs phase. So that's like pretty soon. And our company website that I personally bet money on is running that stack. So you can take my word for it. More questions? Please. OK, cool. Thanks again. And enjoy the rest of the JSConf.